Socks. Fine. Yeah, I think it's for soft. All right. 
Hello, everyone. Hi, guys. If I could have everyone's attention. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone, for coming this morning. Oh, we are thrilled to have our first official opener of CDERC. We have our presenters. Uh, for this morning, we'll have presentations throughout this entire year. First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Natasha Cordes, supervisor for CDERC and the assessment services here, assessment department here at the school. You've probably seen me around. I'd like to thank you all for coming again. Please sign in if you haven't done so already. The rationale behind uh, signing in is because then we can send you out emails that uh, relate to any workshops, events that we may be hosting. We do have STEM events here, workshops monthly that occur, and a variety of things that happen, and we want to make sure that you're in the know, of course, if you want to be. Anyhow, <clears throat> we do have uh, Spanish interpreters, so if you need Spanish interpreters, please let us know. Espanol? All right. Okay, so I'm so excited to introduce our first two presenters for this year. First, I'll introduce Dr. Flavia <coughs> Fleischer. Flavia, this is her sign name. She is a professor at CSUN. She heads the Deaf Studies program or department over there. And of course, you know, the deaf community, you always have to give a little history background, historical background. Her daughter, Larry Fleischer, her father rather, she's the daughter of Larry Fleischer. Larry, how do you sign that, his name? Oh, I'm sorry. My goodness gracious, uh, it's been so long at this point. Anyhow, Larry was my professor years and years ago when I graduated from CSUN with my BA in deaf studies. Oh, quite a nostalgic memory. Anyhow, very excited to have Flavia here. And then we have another professor from CSUN, Dr. Will Garrow. Will also has several years of experience under his belt, graduated from Gallaudet. And both are here this morning to present <clears throat> and will also be presenting to a group of middle school students right after they're done here. So we're thrilled about that. We're excited for the middle school students. They'll be convening in this space. So once you guys have done are about 12, uh, 1230, nope, 12 o'clock, you might be passing several students, and just as a heads up, that's the very reason why. So I will hand it over without further ado. Thank you so much, everyone. Hello, hello, good morning. Natasha, thank you for such a warm welcome for us. I appreciate that. First, I'd like to thank you for inviting us to come speak today. Uh, I know it's an honor to be the first one. Hopefully, it's a good kickoff for, for your program for the rest of the year. Like Natasha mentioned, I am Flavia. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. And of course, as she mentioned, uh, my father, Larry Fleischer, who is deaf. My mother is deaf as well. But I am fourth generation uh, of a deaf member of my family on my father's side and third on my mother's. I really consider myself a child of the deaf community. My parents, yes, of course, but also the deaf community as a whole. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, and I was a mainstream student. I was the only deaf student in the school uh, with the sign language interpreter. Of course, my parents have asked me often you know, if I would like to go to Riverside, and I'm like, eh, no. They asked me, Fremont, uh, not so much either. I'd rather be with my parents. My mom has offered the opportunity to come to Riverside or Fremont, and I did not uh, take advantage of that. I was in the mainstream program my entire schooling, and once I graduated high school, my parents told me I was required to go to Gallaudet. <laughs> All right, fine. So I went to Gallaudet, and let me just tell you, it was the best decision my parents made for me. It was the best decision of my life, to be honest. It was a pleasure. So after I graduated Gallaudet, I came back to Los Angeles and I wanted to pursue my grad school uh, career with deaf education in, at CSUN and also linguistics. So it was really interdis 
interdisciplinary with three different disciplines. So I started teaching ASL at a community college in Orange County. And I realized that I wanted more of the study portion of, of ASL. So I taught a different, a different area and I needed to pursue my grad school degree. So I went back to Gallaudet for my second master's in linguistics, emphasizing more so on linguistics. I also completed my PhD uh, at Gallaudet. So I do go to different universities. I teach at Gallaudet, Utah Valley, Valley University, and several different community colleges in California. So overall, in the teaching field, I've been here for uh, more than 20 years. Now, I currently work at CSUN. I am department chair for the Deaf Studies. Now, this presentation is very important to me, and we'll be discussing the reason why in just a few minutes. And that is definitely within my field, my expertise. But I think it's more critical to really know that I do belong to the deaf community. It is my home, it is my family. But also, my daughter, I'd like to mention as well. So what we, we, we introduced Dr. Will Garrow. He is actually my husband. Yay. <laughs> but also, we work, uh, we actually met through employment. So it's very odd. So we did uh, meet at work. We've always worked get together. But this is my husband. So when I say my daughter, I actually mean our daughter. We do have a deaf daughter who actually just completed her bachelor's degree in psychology. Yay, thank you. Thank you for that. So she just completed that. However, she decided to not, not to come home, so she's still in Washington, D.C., and she's living there currently. Uh, she works as a nanny for a family, but is also an assistant for a research project in the psychology department at Gallaudet. Gallaudet. So she's definitely going to be applying for grad school in psychology next year, whether it be school counseling or in marriage and family therapy. So she hasn't quite decided which, which one she'd like to do, but I'm hoping she'll come home to L.A., so I guess we'll see. So in a nutshell, that's the reason why we're doing this presentation, and that's why it's very important to me. You are all part of the deaf community. So it, that's very important to me. That's very critical to me. Well, like she said, I'm well, but not like her. I don't come from several <laughs> generations of deaf families. I come from several generations of hearing families, several generations. I became hearing at 22 years of age, though. What do you mean you became hearing? You were already hearing and then you became hearing? What does that even mean? My identity. Thank you. Yes. I had an identity. I started meeting deaf people. All of a sudden I was identified as the hearing person. Before that, I was just Will. Pro rest Snowboarder. Snowboarder. Thank you. So from there, there Will, okay, you're, you're hearing. I'm like, I am? What, what, do you, what do you even mean by I'm hearing? Well, you can hear, right? Yeah, I sure can. Well, then you're hearing. Wait, what? Oh, okay, I guess I am. So, you know, that really started my journey, connecting with deaf individuals. I promise I'll be brief. Uh, I'll keep this brief because it's a very, very long story. We could be here for days. But, uh, Terry, I think you were there. Terry, weren't you there that week? So, the first deaf people I ever met, one of them was Terry, Terry Vincent, first ever. So, she knew me when I couldn't sign at all. Couldn't sign my way out of a paper bag. Hey, how are you? This is, uh, this is the dress. This is all I can do. Hello. So, happened to be my first year, uh, again, professional, and I uh, received my paycheck, and I thought, huh, what am I going to do with this? Harley Davidson, that's what I'm going to do with this, that's what I want to buy. So I did. I purchased a Harley Davidson. Check, goodbye, gone. So, started working, one night of work, uh, snowboarding ski store. Anyhow, deaf people would come in, and I'd say, hey, can I help you? And they'd point to their ear, indicating that they couldn't hear me. And at first I thought, hey, can I help you? And they point to it again. Hello? Oh, what's wrong with you? And I thought, ooh, shit. Oh, let me get our paper and pen here. Let me help you out. So, sold two snowboards that day. Then that week, same week, uh, every day was snowboarding. Every night was out, grab a bite to eat, different bars, if you will. Anyhow, it was fun. It was a really good time meeting a variety of people, and that's how I was introduced to actual deaf people. Before that, I was very involved with the prison industrial complex, women's rights, gay rights, my father, um, civil rights activist himself. 
So I was heavily involved with all of that at a very young age. So I would dialogue with deaf people. We would engage in you know, heavy conversations about different issues, controversial issues, and I would see the adversity that they were facing. I mean, obviously it wasn't the exact same, but there was a strong parallel there. There were these roots to the issues, the roots as to why these things were happening, and very much similar. Years went along, or years passed, and I was asked, why don't you go to Gallaudet, Will? I, uh, uh, what, what's Gallaudet? Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, you know, in D.C., the college in D.C., the university out there. And I was like, oh, after getting the history, I thought, that does seem pretty cool. Yeah. So why not? I sent in my application. Lo and behold, I was denied. I'm hearing I can't go to a deaf university. All right, then. A few more years pass. Submitted my application once again. You still hearing? <laughs> yeah, still hearing. Oh, <laughs> well, then we'll still deny your application. Oh, all right, I get it, huh? So I applied to the University of Greensboro, North Carolina. I was accepted there. <laughs> accepted somewhere. So I went. Finally got accepted. Oh, North Carolina? Yeah, nice. Born in North Carolina. Nice. So attended North Carolina first semester. And submitted my application to Gallaudet again. For a visiting student this time. I was denied. Mm, no. Full on no. Second semester. Submitted it again for special student is what they called it. And I got a big fat no again. Oh my goodness gracious. Okay, fine. Forget it. You know what? I'm done applying to Gallaudet. Next semester, so we're talking fall semester, October, what was that? October 12, 2000. They announced the HUGS program. So they established that. Oh, you were there at the time? Oh. So what is HUGS? And for all of you that don't know, hearing undergrad students, aka HUGS, submitted my application October 12th. I remember the exact day, that morning. They announced HUGS. That morning, guess what? They got an application from Will again. I was the first hearing undergrad student that was actually accepted and enrolled and graduated, so on and so forth. All three of my degrees, my BA uh, in Deaf Studies, at Gallaudet, focusing on autism. Also films, I'm sure you see, saw the film, that was my senior project. And then a BA, I'm sorry, not a BA, a master's in linguistics, and PhD in linguistics as well. So Gallaudet was there for all of my tenure in uh, college experience. We did and not meet at Gallaudet. No, we did not. We actually met at Breckenridge. Breckenridge, Colorado. And we were actually there for Deaf Olympics for the snowboarding competition. So that's actually how we met. I was the team leader, so a team manager for logistics, technically the logistics person for coordinating the event. And I hired him mm -hmm. to convince it. I convinced administration to hire him uh, for the US coach for the Deaf Olympics, for the snowboarding Olympic team. So we hired him, and that's actually how we met. Long story. But I'll just give you the, the short version, the reduced sinus version. But that's how we met, and the rest is history. Well, since day one, she's been my boss. I gotta be honest. <laughs> Let's be real. She Home still, to this day, Home and work teach full time CSUN. Yes, exactly. She's still my boss at CSUN. She's my boss at home. She's my boss <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Life's good, though, right? Yeah, sure, honey. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. So, now that you understand a little bit about who we are, we are thrilled to see you here today. But I was just curious, we are parents of a deaf child who is the age of 22, uh, will be 23 this fall. How many of you are parents of deaf children? Oh, quite a few. Wonderful. Fantastic. You are the community. And that's very, very critical to me. This particular presentation is going, we're going to open with a discussion of oppression. You will see the definition of it. You know, there's a huge, big, long definition. Don't worry, we will break it down for you. You might think, oh, well, is that a negative thing? You know, that discussion is more of a negative aspect. It's really heavy context. I think it's important to recognize that 
we, we do su successfully navigate through it. We are successful in resisting it. Also, secondly, we need to have this discussion as reality. This is reality for all of our community. What is that oppression? We have internal oppression, we have social oppression, political oppression, globally. That's everything that we experience, and that's for our children as well. Our deaf children, what oppression do they face? We need to recognize a lot of those oppressions as a systematic oppression. Now, I wanted to emphasize, that doesn't necessarily mean that people are bad. Not at all. That's not what we're implying. What it truly means is that people have certain expectations, certain thoughts about what it means to be deaf. Those thoughts there don't necessarily coincide with reality. They don't match what our deaf children really truly are, what their abilities are, what they are really about. It really does not match their ideal of that. So that misinterpretation causes so many issues that we might be experiencing as parents, as academics, as working in this particular field. These are things that we, we face because of that mismatch. So I think it's important to really address that first. At that point, we will move on to a discussion of how our community is ready to have, we have the tools, we have the knowledge, we have the resources to be able to help the, the community as a whole, deaf, hearing, parents, everyone, everyone alike, be able to navigate successfully and be able to resist successfully those misconceptions about what it means to have deaf children, what it means to be a deaf adult, and what it means to be deaf in general, what it means to be hearing. That's on the flip side as well. So I think that's very important to recognize as a whole. So that's what you will be seeing in our presentation today. So any questions so far before we begin? Do you want to add anything? Oh, no, I'm good. Any questions before we begin? So we'll go ahead and start. Fabulous, we'll go ahead and start. Take a moment to read. I know it's a lot of text, but we'll <coughs> explain uh, all this information. I'll definitely expand on uh, particular aspects of this. <coughs> Did everyone take a moment to read that? We'll go line by line. Don't worry. I know it's a little overwhelming. We'll start just in general. I'm sure you've seen that word oppression. Often we use that word oppression and intermix it with discrimination and also use it as a term for prejudice. <coughs> Are those three words the same? Are they different? Are they even related? So it's important to emphasize those three words are very, very different. Now this here, we're speaking about oppression. So this is one of many different types of oppression. Could be racism, which is a well-known terminology. We see that to come up more often than we would see, for example, <coughs> heterosexism. We see less of that often, the, less often in the community. <coughs> These are all different types of oppression, absolutely, but autism is one of those different types of oppression. Now, we will be going back to that in just a minute. Discrimination, that second word, discrimination. It can be connected to oppression, yes, but it is a completely different meaning. How is it different? It's the power portion of it. The power is different. With oppression, there is a power portion of oppression, but it's power within the system. 
Now, discrimination, all of us can discriminate against each other. That's not oppression. Sometimes discrimination can is, is, is there because of oppression, absolutely. But sometimes it's not related at all. I can discriminate against a hearing person. Shit, that would be me, guys. <laughs> See, I, I'll discriminate against him. All right. Against a hearing person as a department chair, meaning I can say, oh, I'm not going to hire this person because they're hearing, just because they're hearing. And that's discrimination. I could. But at the end of the day, I still can't get the access. I can't access the daily society. I can't find a variety of different types of jobs. Often my job options are very, very limited by society. They dictate or decide that what it is that I'm capable of doing. That doesn't mean that we can't find employment. We have to resist and really fight and navigate our way through the system. We have to have resiliency. We have to have that tenacity to continue to fight. It's not impossible. It can be done, but it's much, much harder. And that's what it means by that power within the system. I can't discriminate, sure, but I can't, I can't address the system in the same way. All of us as deaf people and hard of hearing people included, I'll explain that in just a moment, but deaf people as a whole, including hard of hearing, including uh, deaf Latino, deaf African American, we are all stuck within that system. We're stuck. I could discriminate against a hard of hearing person, or a hard of hearing person can discriminate against me, but we cannot oppress each other. That is not possible. Because we don't have the power. We don't have the power within the system. So I think it's important to recognize that we cannot use the word oppression just willy-nilly. Can't throw it out there. Oppression has a very specific definition and a specific meaning. And that's related to the system. It's that systematic oppression. That's one of the large systems. Okay. Now, the prejudice is more of the thinking related. Discrimination, however, that's an action. So that's a good way to really uh, make that distinction. With that prejudice and discrimination, then we have that power. And then we look at that oppression. If one of them doesn't go with the other, you don't have that oppression. You have to have both. So just to help with the perception as to uh, how to interpret it. All right. Are we all following along? Are we clear with the definition of those three words? Are we feeling comfortable with that? Great. Now, someone had asked, uh, what about diachronic? What is that word? That is an English word, diachronic. Now, oppression of a deaf person is autism, but it, does, it didn't just happen. It just didn't just appear overnight. It has been going on through time, through history. It's been going on for quite so many years, and it has built up to where we are today. It has evolved. It's taken, a, taken on a different face, a different form, a different path. But it has built up over time. And that's what diachronic means. It's not something that automatically happened, automatically started overnight. Now, diachronic over time, it's what our construct. It's the diachronic societal construct construct is the idea. Now, societal construct together, what does that mean? Construct means what we perceive. What does it mean to be deaf? What is that perception? Everything that that relates to. Everything related to deafness. It does not happen individually. Our ideas and our concepts are really built through society. That through that socialization, the exposure to media, exposure to other individuals, exposure to uh, education, 
just for example, now our educational textbooks, they don't discuss many important contributions that deaf people have made to the American society. Often they don't discuss many different communities either. Women, Latino, African American, a variety of different things. They don't discuss that. So you recognize why isn't that discussed in the textbooks? And that's because of the diachronic societal construct. <coughs> this is one of many different minute things that really feed into our perception of what society is. Now, as parents, we have a deaf child. So everything we already know is in this, this ideal. Ideal, uh, most of the time, those ideals are wrong. They are not quite accurate. Now, for us who are involved in the deaf community, our, our construct is a little more accurate, but usually it's not everything. There's still certain things in there that are incorrect. The exposure from society really goes much deeper than that. Even myself, I, what I internalize is different. The ideas and the thoughts about myself as a deaf person, that really works against myself. And the reason being is that construct. So that's what I mean by the diachronic societal construct. So now you understand that first, that first line. All right. Funny. Uh, she says that she internalizes it. And then I remember being in Maryland, going out to dinner one night. In Maryland? Yeah. In Annapolis. So we were in Annapolis, Maryland. Anyhow, we were out to dinner one night. We're just talking. And, uh, you know, we were in a bar, a very uh, well-known bar. And uh, we were engaged in this heavy conversation. And she was like, oh, they're really loud over there. It's really loud over there. Do you mind switching seats? It's hurting my good ear. And I thought, huh? Oh, what? Uh, Just imagine that. I felt like a dog, one ear up, one ear very much down. And I said, uh, your good ear, what does that mean? What about the other ear? What's the other ear? Is that the bad one? What do you mean by the good ear? So it's a great example of internalizing societal constructs. That smog, if you will, that built in smog is internalized. It is internalized in the way we think, even about ourselves. And when you know, he said that, you know, <laughs> when, it, when a dog looks at you and has one ear up, and it's kind of like, what? What did you just say? And when he did that to me at that particular moment, I was dumbfounded. What came out of my mouth? All right, let me just stuff that back in. Well, you can't. Let's analyze it. Let's figure out where that idea came from. Okay, so this is my bad ear, I guess. This, this is not really my bad ear or my good ear. They're just my ears. But I assigned value to a particular ear. Now, where did that value come from? Ah, that needs to be discussed. That does come up every once in a while. You'll, think, you'll see things come up and say, you know, we really need to figure out what those particular things are before we can move forward. It's a never-ending process to really figure out who we are. We all will make these types of mistakes and comments, but I think the most important thing is to acknowledge that we are human. And we do have that societal construct. Now, if we recognize that societal construct, we can do something about it. And that would make things better. And make those improvements for our children and for our community and for ourselves as well. So I think that's very critical. No one should grow up with the idea that they are less than. Just because they don't fit with the expectations and the societal norms. Something that society has already had in place without asking us. So I think that's very important. That's an important thing to consider. Now that societal construct, it really does build our position. It builds our perception. 
So you have your one good ear and your one bad ear. So that's a great example of that political positioning that we take on. It could be something very minor, it could be something very major. That's a very small example, but there could be much larger uh, examples. How a deaf child should be educated is another larger political example. That's a huge political position. Often we take a position based on the idea that people who are deaf, hard of hearing as well, we include the hard of hearing, someone who is deaf is not fully human. Now that means we have to fix them. Obviously they're coming from a position of something's missing, something's lacking, something's wrong with that person. They don't hear, they don't speak, oh, that's something wrong, we need to fix it. That particular position is established from our societal construct. Now we see this person as there's something wrong. Now what happens is that we react, we think and we behave based on that position without really realizing that that's the societal construct. That's not fact. That doesn't, that, that, there's that mismatch with what a deaf person truly is. Now that position of seeing a deaf individual, oh, they're broken, they are the broken people. That's a problem. Now what happens is you end, you end up elevating what it means to be able to hear. You elevate the importance of that. So the value, that everyday value that we apply to ourselves, to our children, to any of our friends, to our community members at large, we apply value to them. Okay, now wait. Let's take a step up. Let's take a step back. We really need to go back to where that position is coming from. Now that position that I just mentioned, we respond, we react, the ideas that we suggest, the inventions that we have, th the things that we often connect to progressive society. Often, that's really rooted in that feeling of decreasing someone and elevating the person who can't hear. So what we experience is that aggression. Now the aggressions that's what we, we can give examples of. It's more so something that you can see, something tangible. Before this, anything above this text line, you can't really see it. There's nothing tangible for you to, to see. It's all in, your, in, in the media, in your uh, mental construct. All of that put together, it becomes cumulative. But if you take just that one little thing, we don't realize, we don't see the larger picture. We just take this one little thing, oh, no big deal. That one little thing is part of a larger picture. So it's hard to see the dehumanization of other things when you see these little everyday things. So like, for example, like laws and policy. These are things that we discuss and see every day. It's what we call the aggressions. There's three different categories. There's micro, meso, and macro. Now, how to identify what falls under what category? It depends on what you see, on what you feel. For example, if I wanted to analyze America, the United States, their federal laws for deaf education, now, I take this federal law for deaf education. They're not looking at a deaf child as a whole child. They're basing it only on the problem with the ear. They're ignoring the whole child as to what they're really capable of. Their cognitive function, their emotional function, their social skills, their psychological abilities. 
it's, this child is definitely a rich human being, but all they're focusing on is just that one organ, the ear. Our laws and our policies for the federal government, if you truly look into that law, it's all connected to the child's ear. It's nothing connected to the whole child. So that, that is the macro aggression. So now if you want to see how that impacts the state, okay, now let's take a look at California. Now at the state level, is there terminology in that law that says they have to sign, that they have to be involved in the deaf community? That's not mentioned at all in those laws. Are there services from the deaf community to provide support? That's not mentioned as well. So that would be a meso aggression. If the federal government is macro, <coughs> meso would be at the state level. And then down to maybe your local school district. Now for myself, where I'm from, where I was born and raised is LAUSD, Los Angeles Unified School District. It's a huge, huge school district. Now their local educational services, what they provide for a deaf student are very, very minimal. Where's the support for signed environments? Where's the support for the whole child? There isn't any. So that is the microaggressions. Or we can look at it as the state to the local school district to a certain teacher in the classroom as the macro, meso, and microaggressions. How they implement the education. It's that those three levels of size. It's based on what it is that you're actually analyzing. But that aggressions, those do pop up every single day. As an individual, every day we can really show examples of what has happened to you or something that's happened to your friend or something that's happened to your child or your nephew, a family member. We could list these things all day, but if you think moving up the chain, often the laws and the policies are very vague. So it becomes hard to target exactly where that aggression is coming from. Often the laws and the policies, they have different legislation backing it up. They just mean that this, this child is something that's broken. They don't actually specifically state that in the law, but individuals, often for, often for individuals, it often becomes very clear. In the policy, it's very vague which is the reason why it's harder to fight those laws and those policies because it is so unclear. So that's the micro, meso, and uh, macro aggressions. So we'll be giving examples of that throughout the presentation too. I want to give you an example of macro. At the macro level, 54% of deaf people or deaf children are in classrooms with no language at all. No language at all, guys. 54%. That, that's nationwide. In the state of California, it's 52%. Not much smaller. So imagine that, folks. And take, for example, at Gallaudet. You have new incoming freshmen. 25% of them don't have any language at all. They don't have any sign language. Now at CSUN, we have several students that are learning ASL for the very first time when they get to us at that collegiate level. One person I can think of right now in particular, he didn't learn sign language till the age of 22 years old. At 24, he just learned what his father did for a living. Imagine that. Imagine that disengagement from your family. Imagine. You can see at the macro level, meso level, micro level, that direct impact on an individual. And the big reason could be, you know, maybe LAUSDs to blame. Seven million dollars they have for budgeted for deaf education. Thirty-five million dollars for speech therapy, guys. Huh. How much further are we willing to invest in just forcing speech on a body? It's, it, it's terrifying. It scares the shit out of me, to be quite honest. It does. I think it's important to emphasize, you know, we're speaking about education. We as a society, that social construct, 
Language equals communication equals speech. So all of those things are linked, is what society believes. That's not true. Language is different than communication. Communication can be used through language, but language does not equal communication. See? So that's where it becomes complicated. Now, language is our human cognition. It allows us to build concepts and understand the world and make meaning out of things. What does that relationship mean? What does this item mean? And it increases. It becomes more complex. These meanings become more complex. For example, a more complex meaning would be like understanding war. It's more than just people fighting against each other. It definitely goes to a much deeper level. It could be economic exploitation. It could be control. We want something that they have, or they have something that we want, we have. Some, something against a particular idea of individuals. So there, it's much more complex in layers. So that's what language allows us to do. Communication is just one form of expression. We use language, yeah, sure, but we use other things as well. But language for cognition is different. Language that does not discriminate between speech, between spoken language and sign language. Both of them run from the same place in your brain. Both of them are critical for critical thinking skills. Now the difference between signed language and spoken language, the difference between those things is who can access them. That's the only difference. That's it. That's the only difference. Now obviously, a person with a hearing loss has difficulty having full access to spoken language. So there's another natural alternative. But it's hard for us to really think about that. Our society measures success based on their ability to hear and speak. And that's the reason why us as a community, we have a difficulty agreeing with how to approach that. And that's because of that social societal construct. So now what we'll mention that the importance between language communication and speech is completely different. Speech is just a modality skill. That's it. It has nothing to do with the ability to think, the ability to be, have critical thinking skills and propose ideas and thoughts. That's totally separate. Now, your example was it that you just said, uh, the LUSD. A side, a side name person. for a person. Sorry, John Back. That's how you signed it. I knew I knew what the example she was going with, so I was just helping her out there. So many of my deaf students who reach the collegiate level, they feel disconnected from their family. Many of them also, the families might speak a different language at home. It could be Spanish, for example. They feel that disconnect. There's no real investment in that family connection through Spanish. They struggle to make that connection. It's important to recognize that, that it's not that hard. It really is not that hard. The time and the commitment, yes, that needs to be there. But overall, I think every day there should, have expo there should be exposure to different language. Explanations, it could be very simple as come cook a family recipe. Come with me, come stand with me and cook a family recipe. What is this? Oh, this is what you signed for it? Okay, great. And the Spanish word is this. Spell it out, that's fine. Write it out, that's okay too. But have that language reciprocation. That internalizes the, the child into their, at their home level. And that's through sign language. And also through their home language. So I think we, on a daily basis, don't do that. And the reason is, we think, how? Why is it so hard to think about how, how it's done? It's that societal construct. That's, how, that's what it goes back to, about what it means to be deaf. On top of that, we have another societal con 
construct of what it means to be Latino. Latinx. Latinx. Be Latino, Latina. A Chicano, Chicana. That's another, uh, another layer. What it means to be black. We need to recognize and figure out how to really coordinate all of those, those resistances to make sure that our child grows up with full pride in the whole of who they are and their heritage. Proud to be deaf, proud to be white, proud to be female, proud to be Latino, proud to be whatever, proud to be whatever it is that they are as a whole. And that's what I mean by the whole child. That doesn't necessarily happen. So what I see happening is the hearing people, people who can hear, they accrue privilege. Different signs for privilege, what it may, what it may be. I sign privilege this way. So they accrue privilege. Now that privilege, it's not because you did something, it's because you can hear. It's automatically given to you. At the movie theaters, simple example. You can say, oh, Friday night, what we're going to do? We're going to go to the movie theater. We're going to go watch a movie. We as a deaf community, we have to wait and find out when it's a captioned movie. Oh, hey, great, Monday. Perfect, perfect example. Here's Monday. Monday. Oh. You have to wait until Monday night. Oh, yikes. At 5 o'clock specifically. <laughs> wow, I'm still working at 5. I can't even make it to a movie on a Monday <laughs> night at 5. What happens family plans it on Monday night? So talk about privilege, that's just one simple example. But it's those minor privileges that accumulate. Now there's a Facebook uh, trend right now, it's hashtag hearing privilege is whatever the case may be. So you can take a look at that and get an idea of what people are saying about hearing privilege. Now, let's take a step back. That doesn't mean that being hearing is bad. That's not what that means. But it means that they are given something. They are given certain things. Different permissions. Certain opportunities. Automatically. Just because they can hear. That's all it means. Now we hear people, like my husband. Podcast. Great example. We're driving here today. I was able to listen to a podcast the entire drive. See a podcast. Quite entertained. Learned about different stuff. Ooh, didn't realize that. Didn't think about that. Huh, very neat. Neat drive. An advantage I was able to take. And he would tell me, I, I, of course it was kind of funny, but he was exactly right. He was trying to tell me that as I was driving. Uh, we as deaf people, we definitely could put things in cars. We could create things, invent things to put in, in cars to take advantage of that opportunity to learn. But our society says, oh no, 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 we can't do that. No, that's not appropriate. Again, because that's a, because of the societal construct. construct and the lack of understanding of different skills to be able to manage driving and doing other things at the same time. We sign and drive all the time. <laughs> Let's be honest. She does. She never shuts up, guys. She never shuts up. See? See? I haven't had an accident, though. It was the last time I had an accident. It wasn't even my fault. It was 25 years ago. Um, yeah. Accidents don't happen in the deaf community. All right. Funny guy. All right. So with that, I think we as a community can really be creative of what we can invent for our vehicles. But it's because of these things here that we're stuck. Who's going to catch on to that idea? So there's a lot of the, the systematic power that we as a community lack. Mm -hmm. Any questions about this slide? You feel comfortable with the definitions in the back? I have a question. What was that? Oh, here. you want me to go to the front? Oh, okay. Come on up. Okay. I guess I'll stand right here. Okay, so my question is, so yes, I can give my name. It's Blake, hi there, <laughs> school psychologist intern here at CSDR. Okay, so I have a question. When we talk about the definitions of oppression and discrimination uh, and prejudice, something that I see so very often 
is internalizing that oppression. For example, oppression, if you're in a minority or a group of minorities, you can't oppress each other. But what, is it, what does it mean when you oppress each other? What does that truly look like? So that internal oppression. All right. That was a great question. Now we understand the difference between oppression, discrimination, and prejudice. Oppression, like, the, like he just explained, requires power and prejudice. You have to have both power and prejudice, discrimination and prejudice with power to have that oppression. Now there's a different terminology that was mentioned. Internalized oppression. So that term is used within the field of oppression studies. And what it means is that you are a member of that oppressed community. And that's something that you take on. For example, like I mentioned, the good ear. That's something that I just mentioned you know, spontaneously, my good ear, my bad ear. That doesn't really make sense, but that's I've internalized that oppression. I've placed value on my own ears when there's no need for that. That's not appropriate. That doesn't fit the deaf community. But the value that I have placed on my own ears is something I've internalized. I've internalized the value, the belief, the idea, the construct of what it means to be deaf. I've internalized that, I've taken that on. Like you said, that, that smog feeling, that everyday smog that is there all around us. We can't see it, Some, well, sometimes we can see it, but most of the time, it's just something in the air, and we internalize that every single day. That smog analogy comes from an individual by the name of Beverly Tatum. They wrote a book uh, based on why all black kids sit together in the cafeteria. It's a wonderful book, but the definition, she explains, us as an oppressed community do internalize that oppression, but we internalize it without the power behind it. There's no power portion. I can say, oh, this is my good ear, this is my bad ear, but I can't fight the system to receive the same opportunities, to receive the same items that are automatically given to hearing people. I can't. So that's what we call internalized oppression. The use of internalized oppression, it might seem misleading, if you will, thinking that, oh yes, we can oppress others. No, that's not what it means. Myself as a white person, not as a deaf person, but as a white person, I can oppress brown and black people. As a white person, I have that privilege. That power is there. And that's because of there are so many white people. You might they might see this I might see something the same way as other white people see see something. Of course, I try every day to remind myself of my white privilege and I fight against that every single day. I teach my students I argue with my students about white privilege every day. I try to take on my white privilege and take accountability for it. Now, I have power as a white person, but not as a deaf person. Even if I internalize the value beliefs of hearing people, it doesn't make a difference. So that's what that internalized oppression means. I think I just wanted to piggyback on that a little bit. We have to think about that system. How other, you know, whether or not you feel a certain way about deaf people or not, there's this impact to the system. For example, captioning. How she feels doesn't impact that at all. But there are different things such as that. So those that can hear, such as myself, how do, how do we have any control over the movie theaters? Do you know any deaf people that own a large movie theater? Any, anyone? I don't know any, do you? 30 minutes, okay, one. <coughs> How many movie theaters in the uh, Riverside area? Je Seriously. It's fun. Right. So all hearing people, we've had captioning since the 1920s, guys. 
1920s, hmm. yes. And we won't do that because you know what? Hearing people's don't like the aesthetics of the captioning on the screen. It, you know, and that history has built upon itself. It's more cumulative. Again, it's that system. It truly is systematic. Another example, oh, there was something right at the, oh, here it is. Okay, you guys all sitting in this audience, how we're set up here. Do you like to come up here and talk in front of the group? Or would you rather sit where you are, are and talk? Well, you know, autism. Again, how we're designing this space. How do we design this space today? That's impactful. The camera itself, the way it's set up. Why don't we have a camera that's 360? So it captures everyone in the audience. There, It's out there. It's out there. It's just not available today. It's expensive. It's very expensive. Expensive for them. It's customized. So right now we're having that one-to-one. -one. And in order to know what the audience is saying, you have to be able to hear. Conceptually, if you want to include deaf people thinking about sign language, that's what you should have done from day one, having that camera that has the capability of capturing an audience, that 360 capability. A squared room, no, you would have a circle room, a room that was circle. You know, in terms of just safeties, having an arch. That would be more secured than safe, uh, square. But we don't include deaf people, their knowledge, their history, their understanding, their perspective, their ways of being in anything. So that's, that's the system that we're talking about, guys. How society, how they design things, it's based on the needs of hearing people. So hearing people navigate without even thinking. Deaf people have to navigate spaces all the time that are designed by and for hearing people, which means then you have to develop different skills, different tools. And that's the next slide, actually. Now, he mentioned developing a different set of tools that will allow deaf people to navigate through spaces. Spaces could be, it's a very general term. It could be an educational classroom. It could be a grocery store. It could be your home. It could be anything. Cyberspace, that's another space. Everything. So those spaces are not designed to really include or designed with the deaf community in mind. There was no participation and full investment of the deaf community. They were, se they were separated from that. Now the deaf community would include deaf hearing, hard of hearing. It includes all people. It includes all of you in this room. Your exposure and access to the deaf community just means that you are acquiring and learning the, the different knowledge and the history and the trends that are available the different skills, the different skills for different areas. It could be for education. It could be for interaction with another individual at a restaurant. It could be uh, just different skill sets, different tools that we use, like a phone or pen and paper, gesturing. Different types of tools that we use that we as a deaf community have already developed. And that's through years and years, well, centuries even, since the beginning of time, since deaf people have been on Earth. And that has just been passed on through community knowledge. So that's what the community is. It allows you to really acquire and learn that information, the knowledge and skills and the tools that you need to navigate. Now, the deaf community cultural wealth, that's specific to the deaf community. But let me tell you, we have the Latino community wealth, black community cultural wealth. We have all community, every single community has their own community cultural wealth. Mm -hmm. It is there, it is present. Now the deaf community cultural wealth, that's specific 
specific tools and knowledge that will educate how deaf hearing people as a whole can work together to be able to navigate through these spaces with, of course, recognition of full support of the full human dignity and value for all of our deaf children. So that's what we call DCCW, Deaf Community Cultural Wealth. The CCW, that concept is really more so established by an individual by the name of Tara Yoso, who teaches Latino studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Wonderful, wonderful lady, wonderful individual. She argues that often Latino communities in the educational system are rejected. They are not integrated. Their child gets to, arrives to school with language, but often we say, oh, no, no, you don't have language because it's not English. They have language. They do have language. How, we can, how can we use that language to be able to support their learning and be able to maintain that community cultural wealth? At the same time, also supplement with the American cultural system. Their white, hetero, Euro-centered classical knowledge and add that community knowledge in there. That's critical. And this, that's what this particular slide means. We've adapted this because deaf people do have deaf community cultural wealth. Absolutely. So thank you, Tara, for that. So we wanted to accommodate, we wanted to adjust the slide to match deaf community cultural wealth. So that's, we've kind of gone over that. Now within deaf education, how can we apply that? We have just barely scratched the surface on this. I don't fully see the integration of the curriculum based on this just yet. We see adaptations of the curriculum, but what about the curriculum that is based centrically on this idea? What would that look like? At home, you incorporate your community cultural wealth, also the deaf community cultural wealth, what would that look like? Ideally, what would that look like? That's a great question. We have so many questions, but we know that's where we need to go. That's where we need to end up. Why do we need to go to that particular spot? Because our deaf children will find themselves with full positive support, full enthusiasm, and have what we call the agency. Agency meaning I have a place a place that I belong, a place that I am valued, something that I can invest in. And that's what an agency is. And that's what we're waiting for for our children. But instead, our curriculum primarily says, oh, well, you belong only if you can accommodate us. No, you belong as you. You belong as you as an individual. That's the point of this community cultural book. Yeah. You want to add? <coughs> no, I was just thinking of curriculum. It makes me think of a question. What's the name of the boat that Lauren Clerk came to America on? Anybody know? Shh, you, zip it, not you. <laughs> this was a former student of mine. <laughs> Come on, not you. No, 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 not allowed. Uh, anybody? Come on, guys. Anybody in here know? Nobody? You know the n boat that Christopher Columbus came on? Ah. The Santa, Santa Maria. Maria. There's three different ships, but that was one of them. The Santa Maria, the Cunada, the Nina. We teach children to memorize that information in history books. Christopher Columbus. Slave trader, guys. Slave trader. But you remember the name of the boats that he came on? I'd rather not, guys. Yeah, who cares about Christopher Columbus? Lauren Clara, on the other hand, helped with founding the first deaf school in America and in the first public school in the United States of America. He helped found those. What's the name of the boat? Anybody know? The Mary Augusta. Mary Augusta. Mm -hmm. 
ASD was the first deaf school. In public education in general, yes. So ASD, first state public school. state sported school, basically, in the United States of America. Yeah. Public means what? It means a state school? Federal and state funded school. That's what a public school means. It's not a private school, that's totally different. Public is a state and federal funded school. American Schools of Deaf was the first model in America. But we don't discuss the important investments that a deaf man from France made to the American public system. We don't discuss it. And that is the problem within the system itself. Now, DCCW, of course, there are many more things that we can list, but this is the, the six different capitals. The different capitals, often we see the word capital, often we think of money, finances. But this is actually related to skills, knowledge, and tools. There are six, and within the deaf community, we have these six here that are listed. Linguistic, social, familial, aspirational, navigational, and resistant. So all six of these, of course there are many more. It could be spiritual, spiritual capital. There's a variety of different other things that we could list here. But all six of these capitals, six plus, all center on what the contribution is to DCCW. Now, linguistic capital specifically. Now, within the deaf community, that's that naturally founded language. That's not only in America, that's worldwide. Deaf people meet another deaf person and develop their own language. And that happens everywhere. We have many different sign languages ar around the world. That really is created by, for, and of deaf and visual and spatial individuals. Now what contributions to general society are there? Oh, there's plenty. The deaf community has been fighting for the value of all people. To be able to educate everyone through ASL, not just spoken English. Whether it be learning ASL, learning Spanish, English, of course would be a must, and then you know, it could be Chinese, it could be Arabic. There's a variety of different things, and also the language at home. That should be taught in the schools. That should be supported in the schools. The reason for that is that there's cognitive benefits to every single one of them. Also, when we become old, our grandparents become disengaged from the family because they lose their hearing. Oh, see, you cited. But they lose their hearing, and often they struggle. We often put the burden on them. The burden is on us because we don't sign as a society. So there are many benefits, a lot of capital that we can contribute to the community in general. Now, specifically for deaf children, that linguistic capital. I think this is one of the most critical items. How signs are developed to be able to incorporate literacy. Often we feel like the sign can't relate to reading and writing or the sign doesn't bridge to learning a different language and that's not accurate. ASL has already been developed with reading and writing in our environment. That naturally will come into play. We see that through studies of fingerspelling. Fingerspelling is a critical aspect of it. Signs, of course, yes, but now we haven't really discussed and fully analyzed how a deaf person who is genetically deaf 
who has the skills and knowledge and tools, hearing parents as well, can, can also pass on those hearing skills, knowledge, and tools. Now with a deaf child, how can they read and write? On grade level or above grade level. How does that happen? How did this child accomplish that? Now we take that information and make it become a, a full curriculum. And we haven't seen that implemented yet. So instead, what we're seeing is modifications of what our society thinks is best to be able to teach deaf children how to read and write. So we as a deaf community at large, we are all aware. We all have knowledge, and that is through years of experience. We pass on that knowledge, that experience, and those tools. Now that is capital. How we can translate that to the school and also to the home setting, that's the important piece. We can apply it to different languages as well. You can sign and have uh, Spanish words on the math as well. That is possible. That's one possibility. I mean, there's a ton of different possibilities that we truly need to discuss, and we're just not there yet. Yikes. Just some examples here. Now, social capital. Now, if a problem were to arise, it would be simple as, how, who do I complain to? Who do I talk to? We assume that we all should know who we talk to. Most children without full access to communication at home and school don't acquire those type, that type of information. Often it has to be taught directly and really explained to the child. A child with a full access to language picks up that information naturally through incidental information. Information in their environment. That's something that they just know and put in the back of their brain so when it happens to them, they remember things that have happened to other people previously that they've been experienced to and they can select different skills to accommodate. That is capital as well. We as a society, how can we provide support and network? Now we moved to a different state and our daughter being deaf, the school for the deaf in that particular state, boy. Ooh, no, 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 <laughs> not an option. They don't want to keep Lord. children there. They really are more adamant to put children back into their mainstream school. So we're thinking, how can we manage this? We lived quite a distance from that deaf school. So we thought, okay, I'm going to need an interpreter. What do we do? We network. I know a person who knows a person who knows a person who knows some other people. And that's capital. That's that social capital. Mm -hmm. We must provide full access to networking and support to all people who enter our community. Say, so, hey, you know, do you, do you know we have X, Y, and Z? We should offer that. Don't wait for them to ask. Offer it. That's capital. Again, more social capital. People think, oh, well, hey, that's what I can be. Or, hey, you know, I, that's not what I want to be, but I'm going to pick a different, different, uh, different field. For example, Helen Keller. That's one individual who's deaf and blind. Are they the only one? You know, where are the other deaf people that they can aspire to be? You're very lucky to have wonderful role models here at CSC Riverside. And that means you are off to a great start in those areas of capital. <laughs> Fantastic. That's wonderful. So we need to keep that. At keep home up, too. We need to keep up that outreach. And people who are here continue to think about these things. Now, if <coughs> something were to happen, I know I can get support from my community because they have an investment in me and I have an equal investment in them. That's a little bit different than a friendship and a social connection. There's more of a value there. <coughs> you remember at the very beginning, I, I said thank you for who I am. I thank my community for who I am. I really have to thank them for that. 
Without that community, I would never be who I, who I am today. So I truly thank them, and I recognize their achievement, their accomplishment in me. It's a deeper level of caring, a deeper level of value, deeper level of commitment and love. And that's that familial capital. So interesting. I have 100 hours worth of videos, interviews with our deaf students at CSUN. Everyone says, after coming to CSUN, learning in the Deaf Studies program, learning about deaf people, they have that DCCW, and they want to give back to the community. They want to establish a school in perhaps India, or in another country, or continent. They want to work with deaf individuals. Prior to the Deaf Studies program, they didn't have that interest. And eh, maybe it was interior design, architect, whatever the case may be, or engineering. They, once they got into the Deaf Studies program, their trajectory entirely shifted, and they did not want to leave. And it's nice to see that investment here, that familial capital, that vested interest. It's a little bit of a different concept than that family bond. Now, that family bond, that will be strengthened with a full investment mm -hmm. and full support of the child. That disconnect isn't going to happen. Now, what families do when they invest in the deaf community, in their child, they are bringing the deaf community into their homes. It becomes a larger network of support and a family system. That doesn't mean that you lose your child to the deaf community. That's right. the wrong societal construct. We as a society push that construct. That's not accurate. It's the other way around. It's actually the exact opposite. You are embracing your child and bringing them closer to the family, incorporating the, the deaf community. Now, different tools and ways that we order food, for example. Something very, very as simple as that. Hearing people, they can learn from the deaf community and teach their children, sure. But hearing people themselves don't need to apply that. So often they don't have the first-hand knowledge or the tool or the skill because they don't need to apply it to their everyday life. Deaf people experience this every single day. They figure out what is the most efficient way, what is the most effective way. So there's a variety of different options they have to choose from. It could be ordering from their phone, pointing to a menu, gesturing. They have figured that out already. <coughs> Now, that simple concept of ordering food is a tool. That's a tool that we use and we pass along to, to our children as to how we order food. Order food. Okay, great. We can go through the drive-thru. I had no idea we could do that. They order that. They see that from their parents. We pass on that knowledge to our children through navigational capital. Something very simple to something very major. It could be employment. What's appropriate? What's inappropriate? How can I navigate a conversation with my boss who is criticizing me for something. How do I navigate that? That's tools and knowledge that is passed down through the community. We mentioned this here, you know, the design of this room, for example. How we navigate through life. It's just little things like that. Understanding how the system works and how we can truly belong. We do have a place in that system. That's that navigational capital as well. Two more, two more areas left. So just bear with me here. Just recently, I went to a statewide task force meeting, and we discussed the language policy for deaf children. There was one parent, well, there's many of us on that particular committee who are parents. The majority of us are parents. There's also other roles that we play as well, but we are parents. There's one parent who is a hearing gentleman, 
And he said, okay, honestly, I often really have to explain to parents that dreams don't stop because a child is deaf. Dreams should be the same. Why does the dream change if they're deaf? What changes is the how to get there. How to get there. How am I, how, what's the path I'm going to take to achieve those dreams? The dream is the same. But because our societal construct, we often change our dreams and get rid of those dreams that we have. The dreams should be the same. Now it's the how that's different. So the important thing is to understand that we have real barriers. And barriers that, and barriers that we perceive. They could be internal. But those barriers, hearing people don't experience them. They don't have first-hand knowledge on tools on how to overcome those barriers. The deaf community and hearing people within the deaf community do. Deaf people in the deaf community do. Hard of hearing people within the deaf community do as well. So they can break through those barriers, whether they be real or perceived, and allow a child to achieve their dreams. If they want to be an attorney, if they want to be a trial lawyer, fantastic, you absolutely can. They want to be a psychologist in private practice. Sure, no problem. What's scary to me is that many of, the, many of the children say, no, I can't. We need to figure out how we can really change their way of thinking. Yes, you can. Now the how is what's different. Let's figure out how we can get there. Everything is possible. The expectations. Don't lower the expectations. They should be the same high expectation. Now, this child has a responsibility to themselves and to society. Encourage that. Now, just in a nutshell, with a quick story, do you want to share that story of a uh, daughter coming home from high school upset? Oh, oh, which time? Story. Which time? Well, yeah, but there's that. <laughs> Remember, my daughter was Main Street in high school. Six. Six different deaf children. It's very different than the experience here at CSC Riverside or CSC Fremont. Often that's not comparable, but for a mainstream student, it's important that you recognize that it does happen everywhere. It's just on a lesser scale here. Now, my daughter came home from school. She looked oh, upset. Pissed. She was mad. Oh, she was upset. So we looked at her and said, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's going on? She said, my high school teacher at the high school. There's, let me just tell you, there's some study groups, I guess, uh, like a study table time. So they kind of get together with some other deaf students. Six classmates, I believe, six total. Mm -hmm. Six of them. So there's five plus my daughter, so six total. For like a study group. For most of the day, my daughter is mainstream in regular ed classes. On not her own. with other deaf children. Mm -hmm. But for study table time, she's with the other deaf students. So the teacher who runs that table time says, all right, okay, everyone, these six children here, you all, you know how to clean your house. Do you know how to clean your house? You know she asked room, that right? question. Could you imagine? Wait. High, high school. school. High yes, school high school. Children. Make sure that's emphasized. My daughter came home feeling, oh, just embarrassed, humiliated. The teacher really thinks this way of me? I've worked so hard over her thoughts. And then you're thinking, can I clean my house? She was blown away. She had no idea what to say. Well, I. Immediately, as a hearing person with the deaf community. Oh, I was pissed. Responded immediately. Pissed right off. The teacher, I mean, I expected more from the teacher. Come on. I expected from the teacher, I mean, the teacher for the deaf. I mean, in the mainstream setting, typically has the wrong constructs about deaf children. You would expect that already from the teacher. But I was pissed off with my daughter. Because she said nothing. Yeah, you have to clean my house. What? I mean, it pissed me right off. I told her, next time they pose a question like that, you say, no, I'm sorry, I don't know how. Do you mind coming by Saturday and helping me out with that? Seriously. 
Flabbergasted. That's that resistant capital. All of our deaf children will receive millions and millions of resilient capital over their lives, the course of their lives, because of that societal construct. Now, for us pushing it under the rug and saying, no, we shouldn't discuss that. Absolutely not. We need to discuss it. How can we resist it? With respect, of course, and also the knowledge of the right time to say, hey, you know, that's not accurate. And the right time to say, okay, I'm going to hold off. I'm just going to gather some education and be able to pass that along. That is capital. How can we resist it? And what we're resisting? And what we are saying? That's the resistant capital in a nutshell. Teaching deaf pride to resist devaluing of social messages as a whole, as a whole deaf child. Whole deaf child. Now, the next one, I think. Okay, there we go. Never mind. This is just some of our, some of our readings. Now, that's our message for today. Uh, Natasha will be wrapping up uh, in just a second, but uh, <coughs> I hope that with this extra knowledge, you will see the value of using your community knowledge, the knowledge of the community and the networking and the network support to really reach out to other families. We as a deaf community have an obligation to support each other, to reach out to other deaf families. And individuals who want to reach out to deaf communities have the obligation as well. We all need to work together as a community to be able to support the future of our, our humanities, of our human beings. That's very important. All right, round of applause, amazing. Wow, just wow. I, seriously, I mean, I love you guys. There's so much love. I, I am just, I memorized, my mind is blown. I, I, wow, I've got goosebumps for goosebumps. My, my goosebumps have goosebumps. I mean, seriously, very excited. I mean, thank you for everything. That was a beautiful presentation. And I'm so inspired. I hope all of you enjoyed it and feel as inspired as I did. I want you to all know that we we're very, very fortunate to be able to work out live stream. So this is available on YouTube. If you did sign up, I will send out a link. So the YouTube link will go out via email. So you can watch us at a later time if you'd like. Please, you guys, share amongst each other. Share with others. Talk about, you know, talk about this with others that you feel need to know. This presentation was just astounding very, very much valuable and invaluable for parents, for all of us that are within the deaf community. Also, I'll be sending out our CDERC uh, and Twitter information as to uh, what we had here today. So keep your eyes peeled. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it.